we're live. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. As we continue to be vigilant as a consequence of the re uh, coronavirus pandemic, this meeting um, is being held in electronic capacity. And there is a link on the council's website for, um, for, for, for people to join in. Members of the council are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish. If you experience connection or other technical issues, it may help to switch your camera off. Cameras should be switched on if and when speaking to the meeting. Obviously, if there's technical um, difficulties, um, we'll take those into account. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raise hand function. Use of the meeting chat function is exclusively for voting. At the end of the debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the meeting chat function by indicating for, against or abstain. I will declare the result after each vote. Breaks of at least 15 minutes will be held every two hours and will be taken after a speaker in the debate has finished speaking. If we are voting, the vote will be concluded before the break is taken. Other breaks will be incorporated as incorporated, sorry, as appropriate. Now I'm going to move to membership changes that I have in front of me. Um, Councillor Helen Campbell is substituting for Councillor Paul de Court for this meeting only. And Councillor Alistair Ward Booth is substituting for Fiona Guest for this meeting only. Chairman, we also yes. collect substituting for um, uh, Peter Hepton. Uh, Peter, and thank, thank you, thank you, Colette, for this meeting only. I'm going to ask members to introduce to um, introduce themselves, starting with David Barnard. There we are, unmuted, yes, uh, uh, David Barnard. I am the member for Hitchin Rural uh, 36. I've been a member of, of the council for eight years. Nigel, Nigel Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm Nigel Bell. I'm the member for West Watford. Thank you. And Helen. Helen Campbell, substituting Good morning. for morning. Uh, yes, Helen Campbell, in, indeed, and I represent St Albans North, but yes, substituting for Paul de Court. Thank you. Leslie Greensmith. Leslie Greensmith, I'm the member for Goss Oak and Berry Green. Thank you so much. Alistair Ward Booth. Alistair Ward Booth, the member for Bishop Stortford West, and I'm substituting for Councillor Guest. Thank you so much. Peter Hebden. He's being substituted by... Absolutely, Colin. he's in front of me. Sorry, apologies. Calvin Horner. Yeah, Calvin Horner, member for Bishop Stortford East. Thank you. Tony Kingsbury. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Tony Kingsbury, member for Welling. Richard, Richard Thake. Uh, Richard Thake, uh, Nebworth and Codicut, uh, Division 38. Um, don't forget, don't forget Colette, who's... Uh, I won't forget Colette. Colette, I'm going to ask Colette. Good morning, everyone. I'm I'm Colette Whitelow. I represent Hemel Hempstead North East, uh, otherwise known as Grove Hill and Woodall Farm, to those that love the area. And I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Lovely to have you. It's good, great to have you here, Colette. Thank you. And Ron Tyndall. Thanks, Councillor Ron Tyndall, representing Hemel Hempstead St Paul's. Thank you. I'm just going to double check because things can happen. Has there anyone that's been excluded from this that I haven't asked? OK, we'll move on. Apologies at the moment. Are there are no apologies that I have. Going to move on to members' interest. If there are any pecuniary or declarable interests that we need to note. None this morning. Now, there's, there's a notice I just want to bring your attention to. I just would like you to note that subsequent to the agenda publication, legal advice was received that the title of the report at agenda item five should be 
Building Life Chances programme, rather than what was published, Building Life Chances Partnership. I'd like you to make a note of that. And for business reasons, the recommendations have also been amended as per the order of business. Going to open up now to part one of our business agenda item one and invite you to agree the minutes of the um, of our previous meeting held on the 15th of July 2021. What's, is there any comments regarding the minutes? OK, can we take a vote on that, please? Agreed. Alistair's agreed. Tony, Ron, Leslie. <laughs> Richard, thank you. Calvin agreed. North outstanding. Helen, thank you. Nigel. David, I can see your thumbs up, David. Can we take, can we accept, Teresa? I'm accepting it. We can. I can, thank you. Okay, those minutes have been agreed. Thank you. Moving on to item number two, we have public um, petitions, as stated, none have been received to date. Going to agenda item number three. Um, Alex Ogle, our adult care services performance manager, is going to introduce the adult social care performance monitor quarter one of the 2021 22 period. Alex? Thanks, Stella. Just to give a bit of background before I get started, I know you, um, panel, are due to have a session in November around the new three year plan um, for adult social care. Fortunately for performance, we've already had to take that step. So some of this, the, the new performance pack relates to the new three year plan and some of the indicators that we've um, initially tried to co-produce with our co-production board. Um, you'll notice in appendix one, there is a full list of indicators. There's two pages worth almost, um, a lot of which are survey based. Um, and this is part of the work with the co-production board. And it's an ongoing piece of work. We're due to try and um, restart our local surveys from the next quarter. Um, so you should start to see less gaps in that kind of that overview of performance at the back end of there. But we can answer any questions post this if you if you do have any. Um, I was very quickly just going to start with some kind of review of activity. And it's a, it's a bit of an odd time, quarter one, because at the time of publishing this report, um, things have changed slightly. So some of the figures have gone up and I'll kind of reference those as we go through. Um, but just to initially give a kind of flavour of what's happening activity wise for us in adult social care generally, to be honest, across the eastern region and nationally is um, activity is going up quite a lot. Um, so that kind of first paragraph we have there, um, it references um, active referrals. So this is open cases with adult social care. So this is anybody that we're dealing with, be that waiting for assessment, receiving a service, um, have an open safeguarding, but that's much higher than it has ever been. So we've had about a 5% increase than um, where we were pre-COVID, so pre-March um, 2020. So Prior to that, we had about 20,000, 28,000 open cases. We've now got over 30,000. So there's been an increase there. And that's generally being fed by an increase in new contacts coming through the front door now. So we've we've had about an 8% 8, 8 increase in new contacts um, from adults requesting support from, from the local authority. Um, and that's gone up, has, an, has then had an effect on cases that are progressing to actual referrals. So your contact is your initial discussion and your referral is actually a piece of work needs to happen, be that an assessment or um, a piece of equipment or a service. So both of those have gone up quite a bit. Um, more contacts coming through and more cases actually progressing to, to a piece of work needing to, to be done for the adult directly. Um, services, we're seeing increases particularly in home care. So home care at the moment has increased by about 15%. So this is long term home care not short term interventions that we do post discharge from hospital. For example, this is adults actually going to home care packages out in the community. That's gone up by about 15%. Residential and nursing has is, is still lower than it has been pre COVID, but we are seeing um, that rising um, at the moment, um, particularly and I've got, we've got our usual slides around new placements into residential and nursing. Um, and some really good news um, from a carer's point of view. So um, 
our carers assessments have been continued to be the highest they've been. So at the moment, um, we're about 22% higher than we were pre-COVID for carers assessments. So there's a lot more carers contacting us and we're doing a lot more assessments around carers as well. Okay. So I'll just go into the packs. Hopefully I'll zoom in a little bit just to make sure everybody can just see what I'm talking about. So the first area we, we normally do some some key highlights. The first area is paid employment. So this is adults with a learning disability supported in a long term service during the year that are in paid employment. So we're about the same as where we were at the end of course of four last year. Um, again, it's a bit odd talking this time because figures are rising at the moment um, from work that's going through. But we by the end of quarter one, we, we were still at about 6.3%. Um, we do the usual breakdown here of our individual service areas across the county. So you've got your adult disability service in Hearts Valley is performing better at about 7.6% 7, 7 of those adults. East and North slightly lower at 64 and our 0 to 25 service, which is adults aged 18 to 25 with a learning disability, slightly lower. Um, but we've highlighted previously that generally those adults tend to be in full time education and therefore not necessarily able to work um, on top of that in paid employment. Um, after the Q4 session we did, a um, panel that asked for us to do a bit of a breakdown on the hours worked, which we've kind of done here. So what we've got here in these charts is a breakdown of those adults aged 18 to 25 and the hours they work. And then those adults aged 26 to 64, which is basically the equivalent of that adult disability service. Um, and the hours they work and the majority working for both areas working one to five hours a week about 39 percent for for adults for those uh, 26 to 64 adults vast majority the 18 to 25 working that one to five hour um time slot and then that is followed by five to ten and then ten to fifteen not a massive proportion of those adults employed are working more than 15 to 20 hours a week Stella, do you think it's best to go through and then ask questions at the end? Best idea, do you think? Sorry, you got mute on Stella at the moment. So now I can see hands going up. Ron put his hand up. I'm, I'm just going to put a halt because Ron put his hand up some time ago. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to let Ron speak, ask his que ask questions. No Sorry, Stella. It, uh, my one is actually, my question is actually on something that's a bit further on. So I'll wait. Okay. OK, OK, it's just I saw your hand up quite quickly, so I yeah. didn't want to let it go on too long before. OK, sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll sit it down until the end. No worries, OK, I'll wait till the end. I'll, I'll work through and then we can we can go okay. through at the end. I think we'll go through to the end and then questions after then on that on, on that moment. All right. Perfect. OK, so um, the next one we normally look at is um, the 91 day indicator, as we call it. So this is adults coming out of hospital being discharged into a short term enabling style service. So that's a specific service with interventions um, of potentially up to six weeks to try and make them into to try and support the adults to become independent again. And then what the indicator does, it's a quarter in arrears. So we look at discharges in quarter four um, and then we allow the 91 days to, to pass and just to see whether the person's still at home on that 91st day. So at home being not back in res not in residential or nursing, not back in hospital, and and they haven't passed away in that time to try and um, confirm whether that service has been successful. Um, we've had a bit of a we had a bit of a drop in course of one again. This is improving at the moment, um, but we had that slight drop into quarter one compared to quarter four or of our our end of year reporting last year. Um, and generally, I will say though that we we do tend to perform better than other regions, uh, other authorities in the region and nationally. Um, some areas you can see here, hi, this is still a 1920 figure here, but you can see Oxford, Oxfordshire with the lowest about 67%, Warwickshire report higher, but generally the national average is around sort of 79 to 80%. Um, so we're still performing higher than those. And we do a bit of a breakdown here again, just to show the, the difference between age bands for female adults and male adults, um, generally female adults, um, we support more female adults in adult social care and generally they have more success out of the um, the, the discharge into enabling style care than male adults. And again, that age band of 65 to 74 tends to be the most successful age band um, of adults over 65 that go through the service. OK. And then we just look at direct payments. We kept these in because there's, there's a lot of work going around new strategies around direct payments for, serve, for, for adults and carers. 
Um, performance has dropped. Um, for those of you that were there for quarter four last year, was well, it was obviously a very different year in regards to to activity. Uh, at the beginning of the year last year, um, we had a big drop. So this looks at adults in the community that are supported with a direct payment. And a direct payment is um, is basically the adult's personal budget that has been discussed and agreed with the with um, the council, and they choose to take that direct that budget in the form of a direct payment, so they can go out and and buy their care or choose what kind of care they want to want to take with it. Um, the remainder is we take that we use that personal budget and we support them to find services. Um, so this is looking at personalization really. Um, and at the beginning of last year, performance had improved quite a lot. And that was because the, the number of adults in the community receiving service had dropped slightly. And now that's kind of teetering back a little bit to being a bit level. And obviously we've had a slight increase in the adults receiving home care directly from us and direct payments are just sort of catching up with that a little bit. But again, um, we are seeing improvements in that since the end of quarter one as well. And again, you can see uh, a breakdown by service there. So our nought's 25. So those are the adults 18 to 25 are more, more successful in regards to um, offering and taking up direct payments, so about 66% there. Um, our adult disability service, again, younger adult cohort, more successful than taking up, there's about 30%. And then you've got your older people services uh, and our mental health services are less likely to, to choose that option as a direct payment at the moment. Um, and you can see there, there's a difference between East and North and Hearts Valleys across the services. Generally, Hearts Valleys performs slightly better um, and more uptake in, in the in the west of the county than there is in the east on direct payments. Um, carers is the next one. So again, similar kind of thing. So this is the offer to, to carers to have that discussion and, and receive support in the form of a direct payment so they can go out and spend the, the, the personal budget that we've agreed with them, um, utilizing their own choice. Um, slight drop, this tends to improve throughout the year. But what I will say again is a kind of new story, good news story about carers. This is still by far the best performance we've had in regards to carers direct payments over the last few years ever. So 76.2 was the highest performance um, that we'd had. I know you can see here from um, at the end of last year, and although 75.5 is a drop, it is still a very good performance. I know you can see here the comparator data is about 80 percent. Um, we there, there's a counting issue, and I know I've mentioned this before is that some authorities only account for carers direct payments as a carer service and therefore they tend to be 100 percent in their reporting as you can see up here um, however we also take into account that some carers choose to have us arrange a carers break or a sitting service with a service user and that's why we're not at 100 percent because we know there's other carer services um, that we provide directly to carers um, but generally that performance is really good um, compared to what we where we've been before and again, you've got that breakdown by our service areas. Um, so Nort 25, very good. They do take up 100% of carers, smaller, co smaller cohort, but they take up, they have 100% uptake. You've got the adult disability services, again, better in Hearts Valleys. And then you've got the older people services. And again, that is better in the, the, the west side of the county as well. Okay. Okay, so the next ones we're gonna get onto are the residential. I will just advise this. The, what I'm showing you here is a slightly updated one just for reference while I'm talking through. But you'll notice this, the graph here just beneath, beneath the house is, is slightly different to what you might have published. And it's just from a talking point of view. So I mentioned earlier that <coughs> residential placements at the, at the time of reporting at quarter one were reporting low like they have been during the COVID um, pan pandemic. Um, but sort of end of year activity around our discharge, discharge to assess service, a bit of catching up in regards to generally this indicator catches up with itself um, around sort of financial agreement and, and agreeing who, who's going to be financing the service. Um, but I will say that at the moment, the sort of March, the April, May time were quite high. They settled quite high compared to where we where they were when we reported and, and published this at quarter one. And it is settling a little bit. It is dropping um, a little bit lower. But at the moment, if we were to refresh quarter one, we'd probably be nearer the 10 per 100,000 as a projection for year end. So you can see our targets 11 by the end of the year, um, which is just under 100 placements for adults aged 18 to 64. Um, but it's just to give a bit of a reference. 
the 7.3 obviously is below target, which is where we want to be. We want to have lower admissions into residential and nursing and only be admitting people that really need that, that service. Um, but it was just to give a bit of a feel for actually we are starting now to see those placements get back to where they used to be a little bit. Um, and they're, although we're still on target, um, we're definitely higher than the 7.3. We're going to be settling higher than the 7.3 at the moment from what from what we're showing from um, from figures. And again, you've got a bit of a breakdown here from for each of the services to, to see the numbers. Again, I don't want to confuse things and we can talk about this in a moment. Um, these figures here are actual placements up to the end of quarter one against that 7.3 figure. That 10 figure is just a settle figure, just just to give reference to actually where we think those placements are, are going to settle actually now for, for end of year, probably. Um, and then the next one is 65 plus. So again, at the time of reporting, really low numbers. So we had 333 um, projected for, for year end per 100,000 population. So sorry, I'm just going to scroll down. So at the time of reporting, just at the bottom of my screen here, we were projecting about 732 new admissions. We're probably going to settle a bit closer to where we were previously. Um, our target for this year is around 500 per 100,000, which is just over 1,000 placements for adults aged over 65. Um, at the moment, again, and the reason I throw caution, um, advise caution a little bit, is that um, obviously COVID was a, a very different year. The end of last year saw some, some stark increases in some activity as people started to flow back into the system. And we think that might settle down a bit. We're still um, working through that to understand the exact picture of what it's going to look like. But at the moment, at the time of reporting at quarter one, we were at this 333 figure potentially, and I think it won't be as high as this, um, but potentially based on quarter one, it is actually looking a bit higher. So that is probably projecting about a 1,050, 1,060 um, residential admissions by the time we get to end of year. But again, we'll have to monitor that throughout the year to kind of get a real flavour of where it's going once we've we started to get quarter two and quarter three in there to understand where where the activity is going to settle down a bit. Um, and again, you've got the kind of breakdown, particularly we're showing high numbers in the, the west of the county at the moment than we are in the east side of the county for placements. OK. And then the other one we do is just keep an eye on safeguarding at the moment. And we are working through some some highlights here to give some um, ins and outs, which we'll, we'll show at different sessions. But just to give a flavour of the, the number of safeguardings that we've got coming through. So again, we project these to year end. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're projecting about 7,701 concerns by the end of the year. Um, slightly more um, inquiries than we were last year, we're projecting at the moment. Um, and we had particularly high numbers in June for safeguarding um, concerns as we came in, but that has settled back down and the numbers are settling. And I think we mentioned last time at the beginning of last year before COVID um, hit, we'd introduced the, the safeguarding portal, which had kind of um, improved the quality of the safeguarding that was coming through and ensuring that we were only getting cases that were actual safeguarding, um, as well as changes to um, the recording of medication errors, again, improving the quality of the recording there as well. So we saw that big drop off at the beginning of last year compared to 1920, and we sort of settled down on this kind of 7,700-ish, 7, 7,500 concerns per, um, per year. Um, so we think that's where we're gonna get. Um, again, a bit of a breakdown of some of that safeguarding. Most, most safeguarding, which is a national picture, takes place in the adult zone home, followed by residential or nursing settings, and then hospital settings. And for us particularly, and again, a bit of a national picture, although our, our percentage is dropping slightly, um, neglects and acts of omission are the highest reported type of risk, followed by physical. And we make reference to um, domestic abuse here, 10.5%, because we are monitoring that throughout the COVID year alongside self-neglect. Um, and that that has gone up by about a percent or two percent from where we were pre-COVID. Um, so we just keep a monitor on that one as well. Um, I'll just very quickly. So before we go to questions, I just want to go through the appendix very quickly. So this is the I'm sorry, it is incredibly small on my screen. So this is the list of indicators that we've come up for the three year plan um, as part of the co-production. It's a mix of what we're using for, for monitoring nationally. So some of the stuff we have to from a statutory perspective, but there is a much higher weave of um, survey based and um, qualitative based information in here. Um, some of which you'll notice it says not reported for quarter one. So we're about to revamp our surveys and send them out from quarter three because we haven't been sending them out under COVID. But hopefully um, from quarter two or quarter three, 
we'll be providing an appendix of some of our qualitative stuff around surveys as well for, for the panel to, to have a view of as well. OK, hopefully I didn't rattle through that too fast for everybody, but happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for that presentation um, in, in depth as it is. Um, I'm going to let, let's let's start start with the questions um, panel. Colette, you've had your hand up for some time now. Colette? Yeah, yeah, thank you. You know, trouble trouble with my mute, not usually like me. Um, my, my question is about um, the uh, the adults with disability employment figures and it strikes me that uh, these are these are people who are likely to be more uh, vulnerable therefore more likely to be self-isolating and have been affected by by covid and so I, i'm not surprised to see that the 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 figures are fairly static but if there are other factors involved in that it would be good perhaps to hear hear why why we haven't got more in in employment i see we've got an action plan planned for 21-22. Can you give us a, perhaps a, a, an idea of, of what sort of things are being contemplated with regard to that action plan? Thank you. Do you want me to come in there, uh, Stella? Yeah, please, Chris. Yeah, so, um, you. yeah, thanks, thanks, Colette. Um, yeah, so we, 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 people with disability, you know, have, have often, you know, often um, clinically extremely vulnerable too, so have really had to be um, very careful during the pandemic and employment opportunities, as, as we know, are challenging um, at the best of times, but certainly during the pandemic, that was particularly challenging. So, yeah, not a major surprise that that's static. We have provided a breakdown of the, the details and of the number of hours worked in response to what the, the committee's asked for in the, in the past. So, we, we've got some work going on. Um, one of the things that we've applied for is a European Social Fund ESIF um, bid to uh, provide uh, dedicated support through um, HAFLD, the Ad Adult Learning Service, um, to uh, really work with uh, a large number of uh, people that earn disability on skills that they'll need for, for employment. Um, so we're going to be using the COVID recovery funds to match fund uh, the, the work that's going to take place. Jack, if Jackie's on the call, she may be able to add a little bit more detail than, um, than me. Oh, Jackie, what are you on, Jackie? I can't remember if she's... Yes, I am. Hold on. Yeah. So I'll bring I'll bring Jackie in a sec. So yeah, so Jack will just talk through a couple of things that we're doing on that basis. But we're we're also um, uh, as we're learning more about how the economy is responding, looking to adjust our response um, to to how we can support people um, as as job opportunities. Now I think probably more quicker than we thought. Job opportunities are coming out and vacancies are increasing quicker than we thought. So we probably have got some real opportunities here, but Jackie will give you some detail around the work that we're doing around the funding. Um, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes. So um, we've put a, a bid in that we're, uh, for a project which we're calling Inclusive Employment. Um, the total value of the support that we want to put in place is um, 2.8 million, as Chris said, that's um, we're applying for European social funding um, of 1.4 million with um, 1.4 match funding from HCC and public health. Um, and we are allocating 450,000 pounds of the COVID recovery fund that we was part of our bid um, to, to, to really prioritise this area. Um, and we're hoping that it will start in January, although um, we're still waiting to hear and we, we don't have a time frame exactly of when the bid, but we're hoping that the, we'll get an answer on the bid in November. Um, and that will allow us um, to work with and to, and to provide support um, into employment for 725 adults with disabilities across the life of the project. And it's a, it's a two year project. Um, which we're hoping to start in January 2022, subject to the funding. Um, and I think even if we're not successful, we will still we'll still go ahead. With, with, but it'll be a slightly smaller um, cohort that we'll be able to support. Um, but basically, this is a funding that will support a team to deliver a project using the British Association um, supported employment, the Bayes model, um, for providing support. Um, and the the sort of outcomes that we've set out there are that 17% um, of all participants would move into substantial educational training, for example, an apprenticeship or full or part-time education, um, that around 22% of all participants would move into sustained employment. Um, and those that are unemployed 
um, 14% we would move into unemployment. Um, and then looking at those um, that are economically inactive and not looking to work, that the that 27 percent of the people um, move into job search or employment. Um, and, and this is because this is an area that we know um, is really, really key. I think when we put the, the bid together, we were thinking that the employment situation would be worse, uh, would be significantly more tricky and more difficult, challenging for people with learning disabilities. But I think we have a real opportunity um, as the um, uh, as, as we move out of COVID and the current situation to actually really, um, really support the, uh, support people with learning disabilities into work. Does that answer the question in some detail for you? Yes, it does. And I think it sounds, it sounds very encouraging, particularly, um, uh, morning, Chris, um, the, the, the information that um, job vacancies are rising because as we're coming out of um, of COVID and as people are feeling less vulnerable and more likely to, to want to take up opportunities, there will be opportunities there for them to take up. So, so thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, very positive. Thank you. Thank you. Ron. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Stella. First of all, a very quick uh, follow on to the last uh, item on learning difficulties. I noticed that referrals increased under to, for the under 65s by 6.4%, whereas referrals increase for the over 65s is only 4.5%. Does that reflect the, the increase in demand from those with learning difficulties and disabilities? Can I ask for a response to, yeah. to Ron's question? Alex, you just want to bring that date, the, the relevant page up. Yeah, for sorry. Now. Yeah, so this this, this uh, paragraph here. Yeah. What I would say as well is, is just a reflection of numbers there. So um, I should have put numbers in there. Sorry, apologies. That So obviously that percentage increase for 1864 number wise, number of adults is much smaller than obviously the, the percentage increase for the 65 plus as well. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking of the fact that because uh, the difference between those we already cater for with learning difficulties and disabilities as against all the older folk in care homes now is, is, is substantially lower, but yet the budgets are level, if you like. Therefore, the, 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 the percentage increase, does that indicate, uh, as I believe, a general increase in the number of people with learning difficulties? and disabilities that we are having to look after, which obviously has a budgetary impl implications. I mean, Ron, that, that I mean, so break that down to two points. So yes, absolutely. The, the demographic pressure for people with a learning disability is profound, as we know, partly because life expectancy is going up for people with learning disability, which is which is great. And as you say, the, 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 the cost per person to support an individual with a learning disability is higher than older people. So they, that, that will all be at the numbers are lower, as you say, Bob. I think in terms of the, uh, the referrals in June sitting higher than pre-COVID levels, um, partly as, as well, that, that's, partly that, that's partly a catch-up issue where people haven't been uh, referring themselves or families haven't been referring people or taking people forward during the pandemic because of those issues that Colette talked about before about reticence rightly to, to, to be to be going out or necessarily seeking support so some of that's playing catch up so what we want to do and, and it's almost getting through what you know where those dipped off during the, the sort of major peaks so really we're going to keep looking at data points every month to see when when if that when if it does that settles down and we've kind of kind of got caught up with the numbers of referrals that may have been delayed during the uh, pandemic. It, not dissimilar to the rhetoric you'll have heard about uh, NHS referrals and uh, presentations to uh, primary care and hospitals uh, being delayed and now coming forward uh, in a bit of a bulge. Thank you very much. Stella, can I go on to my own question now? You can, Ron. Yeah, uh, on page 29, we've got an indicator called the wait list, where we've got a 13% increase. So it's, it's really a question as to why the wait list is increasing. But I'd also like to address my concern generally that we, we don't seem to have an indicator in this item 
which actually gives us our, our assessment performances. For instance, how long do people have to wait for assessments? Uh, is that going up or going down? Uh, is that a staffing issue? Uh, is that you know, uh, the various, because to me, uh, the longer people have to wait for assessments <clears throat> would tend to be of concern, particularly in a situation if they're isolated. Yeah. Yes, we, well, we, we have, and we've got the waiting list there, so you, you've got um, the numbers on the waiting list. Yeah, what, what we're seeing is um, a couple of things. Again, number one, that factor around that I mentioned previously around the, the bold show, you'll, you'll see there in March last year, but also um, March the previous year, the, the wait list is matching, in a sense, the, um, the lockdowns. So yeah. you'll see March 20 when we had a major lockdown and then also between December and March uh, previously, they went right down because of people's reticence to, to come forward. Uh, that's very, very difficult to manage and smooth. Because what I can't do is shift staffing and care capacity up and down as quickly as referrals do. So as as we people recover, recover their confidence, uh, they're going to come forward. And what I can't do is just is, is put staffing up by, by that amount of time, because, of course, during the pandemic, my, my staff were working extremely hard doing other things around COVID response. So we are we are monitoring it. I mean, you know, and obviously I'd want those to be as low as possible. One of the things that we do do, Ron, um, as you know, is we also we don't just sort of put people in a, on, on a list without having a first sort of triage look at those needs to try and prioritise people who's a, whose needs are more urgent. One of the things that we are really having to work hard on is referrals coming through from hospitals because they're getting busier and busier. We're trying to do our bit to keep the hospitals flowing uh, and that's causing uh, an awful lot of pressure. And again, those waiting list models would also match against uh, hospital referral patterns as well. So we're keeping a very close um, eye on it. We've got, you know, we, we've invested in more staffing and we're you know, trying to get hold of the staff that are out there. So we're working hard on it. We do keep a close eye on it. I think Just, your last comment actually was really, to me, I think this also indicates the staffing pressures that we're under, because as you say earlier, and I fully recognise it, if we haven't got the staff, we, we have a major problem with assessments, don't we? If you look at if you look at where we are, mm. um, we've got we're, we've got a significant increase um, from the, the previous uh, from June 21. Um, and then we've got an increase uh, from yeah, the average between April and February 29-20. But actually, if you look at where we were on uh, sort of July 2019, which is the first kind of comparable pre-COVID summer months there, we're not far off where we are now. That's right, yeah. Alex, isn't it, actually? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is, again, why we need that run of months to give us a sense of what COVID levels are and how that sort of come in and out of the system. That being said, I want those waiting lists as low as possible. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stella. Thank you. Thank just, you. Thank you. Just very Thank quickly, you. Stella, just to add to that, because I know Ron had asked about an indicator around timeliness of assessment. So it used to be a statutory requirement to report around timeliness of assessment. What I will say is that anecdotally looking at the kind of wait list and the uh, you know the increased pressure like we, we talked from from Chris around discharge to assess from hospital and the additional activity uh, pre-COVID our average waiting time for assessment to to get an, a new assessment done was around 29 days which and the target statutory target used to be 28 days um, and now it's, it's still around that time it's about 29 30 days so there hasn't been that massive change in adults actually waiting so all the wait list is up the time to actually get assessed is actually still pretty close to where it was pre-COVID. Really good point, Alex. Thanks very much. And I think everybody should be congratulated for being able to still uh, keep the service going under such difficult conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And yeah, ditto to, to, to that yeah. amazing, amazing work. Amazing work has been, has, has been done and continues to be done. Let, let's not, let's note that one. Um, now, I have Richard Fake in front to, um, uh, to answer, a, to ask a question rather, sorry, rather than answer one. Thank you. Um, right, first of all, thank you, Stella. Can I just say I absolutely endorse Ron's remarks and I, and I know everyone else will. Um, Chris and the team, thank you so much for the 
expert way in which you share the um, documents on our screen here saves me messing around trying to read modgov at the same time as uh, having to access chat and everything it's great i'm grateful for it um it, it, it this is just a piece of personal um uh, enlightenment um on the uh, uh, uh the, the, the the time period for uh people main, being maintained in their own homes after coming out of hospital 91 days is that a statutory period or is it just that three months is a reasonable time to think that uh, that recovery is likely to be a sustainable? Yeah, well, it's 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 both actually, Richard. It's a good question. The 91 days is again, it's a national indicator, so that time that time scale is set nationally. Um, the view with 91 days is that if if you take it after say a shorter period, say a week or two weeks, there could often be a, a risk of readmission there relating to. Um, something that you know maybe just cropped up immediately after someone's episode in the hospital that that would that caused the admission anyway so three months are seen as a sort of fair period to kind of uh, uh remove all of those issues that might that might occur and give people a fair chance to um uh get the benefit from enabling style care because an enabling style care is up to up to six weeks um of enabling style care so um, that gives you the, um, the something I had the 42 days. We then need to see how that's been embedded in terms of long term care. So it gives a chance for the full period of the enablement to take place, plus a bit of time for that to be consolidated okay. and to remove any immediate issues post discharge. So hence the 91 <laughs> days. Colleagues in the NHS do look at readmission rates at lower, uh, at shorter time periods as well, but that's the statutory indicator. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the second question is, is around the safeguarding concerns. Um, I, I noticed that in your very useful um, reference at the beginning of the document, you give us a clear indicator of what the individual arrows mean. Unfortunately, um, data and, and some of the performance things are both two, two sets in black, so I'm not quite sure which was which. But on, um, on the safeguarding concerns, You've got a data or data arrow, but you haven't got any performance uh, against it. So does that Im Im imply that, 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 that uh, we, we merely monitor the number of, uh, of safeguarding concerns that come in? And what do we actually do with them? That's what I want to know, really, to be honest with you. Yeah, OK, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so, yeah, this, this is one where we uh, is, is less a performance indicator and more management information. Um, Namely, you know what volume, are the, what what volume are we uh, are dealing with? So that's why I assume Alex has kind of made that kind of neutral colour. Um, uh, what we'll do with them is is under the duties under the Care Act, Section Forty Two of the Care Act, we have to see concerns that are coming through, understand them, take a view around whether they, um, a so-called Section Forty Two decision, take a view around whether further undertaking uh, a multi-agency investigation is required, a so-called safeguarding inquiry needs to take place and you know let to be very clear this is a significant amount of work for every one of these because it by nature if it's got safeguarding there is a potential serious risk to people's well-being so we need to make sure we look at all these properly and then where necessary undertake uh, a lot of work to understand if those concerns have been substantiated and how we can immediately put in measures to reduce the risks to people um so I sometimes it would be easy to say, well, the higher they are, the worse it is because more bad things are happening to people to, to simplify things. But actually, I'd rather know about things and have a chance to intervene either preventatively or uh, even to rectify issues that have already happened rather than uh, those to, to take place under the surface. Not, not dissimilar to the kind of logic that might be put in place in terms of domestic abuse and uh and and what's what figures are actually coming through in terms of uh whether we just know more about things which we we think overall is a good thing thank you very much sir um, my, my my last point is just just an observation really clearly the this covid period has skewed many of the indicators or or, or has the potential to do so it will be quite interesting as we go forward to see what our peer uh counties are doing in terms of whether or not their projections are in line with their past performance. I, I can see the difficulties that Alex and the team have got in trying to project from a first quarter and extrapolate it forward. And, and I guess it will happen with everybody. So I think those peer uh, comparators will now become a very interesting measure of how successful we are in terms of dealing with this, the post COVID situation. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you.
Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Chris, for, for, for the response as well. Um, good clarification. Thank you very much. Calvin Horner, I'm going to ask, um, you'd still have your hand up, please. Yes, th thank you, Chair. Um, my, my question, a, a couple of questions related to direct payments, if I, if I may. Uh, the first one on the um, uh, supporting adults um, with direct payments. There's a statement in the in the report which says uh, the COVID response has meant that um, many adults are not able to to use their direct payments. Um, and, and the first the first aspect of that is whether you could perhaps expand on that. And secondly, is that changing now that uh, COVID restrictions are are being being um, eased? Um, and then secondly, um, perhaps a, 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 an explanation when it comes to carers direct payments as to the difference in performance between Hearts Valleys and the East and North when it comes to adults with disability. Thank you. Yeah, OK, thanks, Calvin. Yeah, so um, as, as Colette mentioned actually earlier that dur during the pandemic, a number of um, uh, services that uh, people with a disability would have used their direct payment for perhaps you know um, a personal assistance to, to help them access things in the community or um, community centres, day centres, day opportunities um, were either closed because of COVID restrictions or people decided not to attend because of the risks that they that they were associated with that so hence the um, some of the uptake around direct payments and the use of them um, fell away. To be clear, we did make sure we talked to those families to make sure well, what other things could be put in place, either virtually, and I saw some really great practice around what was taking place virtually or outside and or in different groups and smaller groups. So that's that's why that happened. Yes, we are absolutely carefully and considered beginning to open up those opportunities again, and part of that's relating to individuals' confidence. So, for example, later um, uh, or just this week, I think, or next week, And, and east and north around um, uh, direct payments. I mean, you, often it's you know how teams work, practice, how processes work, how people are doing things, what 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 people perceive are the services that are that are available in in a community that might mean people need or don't need a direct payment. So um, again, relatively um, small numbers, so that those um, uh, given that it's um, carers rather than total sub number of service users. So that changed um, in that way, especially the differential you'll see in ADS. We're talking about a smaller set of numbers than we are in older people where that change, that differential is quite a lot smaller. Historically, we've had more direct payments in Hearts Valleys than East and North because of real challenges um, in the availability of um, home care that we commission. So that's been a, more of a challenge in um, in uh, Hearts Valley, so people have often opted for a direct payment in, instead to organise it themselves because just we've physically been very, very difficult to source that amount of home care. Those challenges have eased overall, albeit it's still challenged and it still remains a greater challenge in Hearts Valley. That's partly because of the London effect, um, the ability to source um, workforce here in the west of the county, particularly in some of the more affluent areas, St Albans, and etc. So that's what drives that differential. Okay, thank you. Just trying to unmute. Um, thank you again, Chris. Nigel, you'll have your hand up. Nigel Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, I, I, I will pass on this now because others have already um, raised what I was going to, especially on neglect that Richard raised. 
and uh, I, I, same as what others have said as Ron and yourself and, and Richard that uh, it's it's hard really to go into details and ask lots of I'm not going to ask lots of detailed questions on this because it, it, we're still seeing the after effects and coming out of COVID and it's still there and uh, again just to pay tribute to staff so as I say my neglect questions has been uh, answered up to now so I'll pass on that thank you chair thank you Nigel I think yes I agree completely we're, we're still climbing the hill on 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 this one we're not over the top of it yet or even even close to it so it's going to be ongoing um right not Richard you still have your hand up it's your hand it's a further question uh, absolute apologies no just an, an oversight I'll take it Nigel, down and that now I cannot see any other hands up is it's anyone else wanting to come and ask questions around this report or comments on okay are we able to move forward then to the vote on this chairman really that we note the report and any comments on the quarter one performance to be noted I mean, well, the screen's completely covered in things. Wonderful. You're doing it. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. On to a different part than it normally goes to. Right, I think we are there. So performance, is, it is noted, agreed and noted. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel, for your time. And Uh, thank you, sir. Good morning. Um, yes, I, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the paper, um, which a number of you is a similar paper than we've had before. Um, to give you a brief um, uh, history of the sort of support we've, we've given to care providers uh, since last March, um, well, actually the March before last, since March 2020. So um, care providers have been supported with additional costs associated with COVID since March 2020. And examples of the costs that, that we have supported them with are additional staffing costs, PPE, and um, initially occupancy um, challenges, and more latterly testing and visiting. Um, and as, as Hertfordshire County Council, we have supported our commissioned care providers um, with, the financial in, um, with the financial implications of that. Um, and initially, HCC funded commission providers for reasonable additional costs associated with those items. Um, this funding has, um, over the last year and a bit, has been agreed for three months at a time. Um, and uh, through last year, and was funded through the COVID grant that came from government. The total funding in 2021 for um, that, that HCC provided was £12.97 million. Pounds. Um, and during 2021, um, the government funding provided um, provided additional funding for all care providers across the country, but across Hertfordshire as well, um, through the Infection Control Fund. Um, the, they provided PPE through the PPE portal, where providers can access PPE free of charge, and latterly the Rapid Testing Fund. Um, last year, in addition to the 12.97 million of Hertfordshire funding for Hertfordshire providers, um, we gave out infection control funding of 24.2 million um, and uh, rapid testing funding of 3.1 million. In March, um, uh, panel uh, cabinet agreed um, to continue funding um, HCC commission providers to September, and our estimates at the time of the cost of that for the first six months of the year was um, nine million pounds, and that was to be funded by the COVID grant. Um, this paper requests that the funding for HCC commission providers continues to the end of March 2020, um, and our estimates 
have reduced um, significantly because at the time of at March, when we were assuming nine million pounds for the first six months, we were assuming uh, we didn't know then that the government were going to continue to extend infection control and rapid testing funding. Um, so the extension that um, the paper requests is uh, are estimated between 636,000 and 2.9 million. That's that's the cost of extending our estimate of the cost of extending through to March. The two scenarios shown in the paper the, the, and the differential between the two amounts are the first assumes that the infection control and PPE portal continue to the end of March. We don't yet know about infection control, but the PPE portal will continue to the end of March. And the second scenario with a slightly larger number assumes that there's no infection control funding from government, um, uh, but that the PPE portal continues. So the total cost of supporting, our estimate of total support, supporting Hertfordshire providers is between 1.3 and 3.6 million. And that's well within the original estimate that we had of the 9 million that we'd set aside. Um, in addition to this, so this is for additional costs associated with COVID and providing support to care providers. Um, this is uh, in addition to £5.1 million pounds that we set aside and carried forward from last year um, to support care providers in financial difficulty. Um, but uh, and, and that is set aside um, against the conditions set out in Appendix 1, where we would um, look to um, be able to support providers in that way. Um, and, and that's really a, a brief overview of the paper. I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Steady on mute. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much. Have you got questions? Just a comment from me, um, Stella, is that um, uh, I, I think we've still got a period of um, significant volatility when it comes to uh, the impact of COVID, um, the impact of the mandatory vaccination um, programme, which means we will lose some staff to the to the care sector, as, as, as people know, because of the, the a mandatory condition of working in, in, in care homes uh, for, the, for the moment, that might change, um, as well as you know increasing pressures in the labour market. So we still have a position where I rate the risk quite highly around provider stability. We've lost four um, care homes um, over the last um, nine months. Um, again, on the whole, in areas where that, that demand was, was not, that supply of care home beds was not needed and, and maybe the, the, those homes we were not in a position to support. Um, but that's actually a much lower figure than I thought we might have at this stage. Um, you'll have seen that we are beginning to see an increase in care home admissions again, which while has financial impacts for the local authority is also obviously helping improve occupancy for providers. So um, clearly we're going to keep a close eye on this. So the ability to stretch out the support that we've got if needed remains useful uh, and we'll wait to see if there's any further uh, central funding uh, for providers. Um, uh, relating to um, things like infection control and testing, which you know are likely to be. Apologies, mute or mute off. Ron, you have your hand up. Thanks, sure. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Chris. I just wonder uh, the care at home uh, rather than care homes, uh, the domiciliary arrangements we have. Uh, I understand that we have a slightly more difficult position with those in, in areas of the county because of providers. Uh, is that becoming uh, more difficult through staffing levels as well? And do we have any indication as to the effects, whether or not the, the, reju the reduction of the universal credit uh, uh, addition of £20 a week will will cause additional staffing issues with uh, uh, from the 27th of September. Um, OK, thanks, Ron. So breaking that down, um, first of all, yeah, I mean, we half just a big county, OK? So the, the kind of pressures around home care uh, are quite varied, not least because of a couple of impacts. One is around cost of living. Uh, which is higher in some places than the other. Also proximity to areas where we traditionally get a number of care workers from out of county, Luton, Harlow, London, etc., has an impact. But so do the things like morality. 
So it's more efficient to run a care round in an urban area than it is in rural East Hearts, for example. We reflect that in the rates that we give. So when we calculate what a fair rate of care is, we calculate rurality into it and travel time, but also the the, the local labour market conditions um, to do that. Um, we overall we are buying more home care than ever, and I think that was in Alex's slides. Now that's a real positive, and that's that's partly because of councillors' decisions um, sort of this time two years ago, really, to invest heavily in um, inflationary awards for for home care workers to try and get them to the real living wage level of about ten pound fifty an hour. That was a fifteen percent increase, and compared to neighbouring authorities, therefore we are. You know, actually overspent on our home care budget, which this sounds um, odd, but that's a success story because we, we're looking to drive support for people at home rather than in um, uh, care homes, etc. So, but it's challenging because the demand's so high that we saw earlier from Alex, particularly in terms of hospital discharges and our average hours per person for home care, i.e. the complexity that's being faced is going up as well. So uh, you, you'll have seen um, so more people than ever receiving home care, but the pressures uh, are still there. On universal credit, um, yes, I, I'm, I'm asking Gary from my money advice unit just to, to look at the numbers. It's likely that, that will that will impact some um, uh, workers because of the, um, uh, the, the, the level of their pay, depending how many hours they do and so forth. In terms of impact in employment, I, I'm not sure it will necessarily drive uh, changes in, 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 in the number of people working in the sector at this stage, because um, it, it won't necessarily change if they worked in, in, a, in another sector. It, it, it will, for some of them, they'll be worse off as a result of those um, changes, um, albeit, of course, we've seen increases in, in the rates that we're paying and inflationary uplifts over the last few years, which, which should have mitigated some of that to begin with, but that, that will impact on people. But I will ask Gary to crunch some numbers and do a couple of examples for us, Ron, on, on what that looks like. I know there was an article in the in the Times, I think, about that just, like, just this week. Thanks very Thanks much. Very much. Yes, thank you. I actually, yeah, I think one of the positives that's anything come out of COVID is that we actually have as a, we have become more caring as, as people. And it's, it's, it's a real, real positive to see that more people are, are being, um, cared for at, at home. Thank you. Nigel, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Can I just ask Jackie, uh, obviously she mentions in the report about the 5.1 million, uh, unspent, uh, rolled over. And obviously we, in theory, covered until March 2022. Could you just comment on that, that, that extra or the money that that's been rolled over financially, and whether we're okay, and you know, just the around that that figure. Um, thank you, Nigel. Yes. Um, at the moment, we haven't had a huge call on that funding. We've 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 considered. Um, we've had a couple of cases that we've considered against it. Um. But, but I suspect um, that when we get through um, to the point um, where the, the vaccine comes in and, and, and staff issues come in, we might, we might end up in a, diff a slightly different position. So um, I, I think it's one that, that we never expected to come in straight away because of all the government funding, all the infection control funding and, and, and the additional support. I think it's one that we need to keep an eye on um, and, it, and, and it's very useful to have that ability to have that fund there. But at the moment, we haven't had a huge call on it, Nigel, no. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Nigel, your hand, is it up or is it down? Is it just forgot to take it down? No, it's down, so I can't get it now. <laughs> no problem. Okay. All right, panel, then I think we can recommend, we'd like to ask to recommend to Cabinet that Cabinet agrees an extension, an extension of financial support for all our commissioned care providers to meet the ongoing additional costs of COVID-19 that are not covered by the government funding and, and support until the end, the date is the end of March 2022. Can I ask you to... There are two parts to that recommendation, Stella. Yep, and the second part, I was going to do it individually, but if you're happy that I go with the two, that's fine. Notes. 
and agrees the Director of Adult Care Services request to fund this support from within the Hertfordshire County Council's COVID funding 21-22 budget that has already been set aside. Can we go for, can we just note that hands up please? Agreed, thank you Alistair, thank you Tony, David, Calvin. Okay, everyone has voted that I can see that has, that has been passed and recommended. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. I know you're having problems with your IT this morning. We're going to take it forward to item number five. It's the Building Life, Building Life Chances Programme. It's a report from the Director of Children's Services, Adult Care Service and Public Health and Community Services. Jackie Albury and Christy Thakur will be presenting the VPAC program lead and head of community of, 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 of who is the head. Excuse me, I've got my words twisted there. Um, program lead and head of community and people wellbeing. Thank you. Good to see you, Christy. Hello there. Um, um, my name's Christy Thacker. I'm the head of community and people wellbeing team and I've been leading VPAC, which is a volunteer and people assistance cell. Um, my colleague Ted Maddox is on um, the meeting as well. Um, he is my deputy head of service. Um, he's going to be sharing the slides because uh, sometimes I get a little bit confused when sharing slides and, and trying to present. So he's, he's um, helping me out uh, today. Um, so, um, are you happy that we share the slides now? Yes, yes, please proceed. Lovely. I'm hoping everybody can see that. Lovely. Yes. Okay. So, I just wanted to give everybody an update on where we're at with the Building Life Chances programme. Um, and. Um, as stated at the beginning, this is a collaborative approach. So this is um, jointly led between public health, children's services and adult care services. Uh, next slide, please, Ted. So a little bit of background to this. Um, there was a commitment in, in March 2021 uh, to ensure with, with uh, public health, adult care services and children's services to ensure that Hertfordshire residents that have been adversely impacted during the pandemic are now supported. We specifically really wanted to tackle the inequalities that have been highlighted during the pandemic. Um, so we're now taking these actions to, to narrow the gaps. So the Building Life Chances programme, which was formerly known as the Tackling Poverty programme, so some of you may have heard that term branded about as well, but we've, we've renamed it to Building Life Chances. It's an initiative falling under the Council's COVID recovery strategy, which was agreed at full Council in July. Um, HTC are coordinating that response, but we are very much working in co collaboration with our district and borough council colleagues, um, as we have done during VPAC. Also, uh, our wonderful voluntary community sector colleagues um, and the NHS, as well as other stakeholders and partners. Um, as we've said, this is a joint, jointly developed approach between children's services, adult care services and public health. And we have used the feedback from a multi-agency workshop that we held um, and also reviewed available data and learning from um, the crisis support that was offered during uh, the pandemic. Um, we've identified a proposed governance structure. Um, so we have themes and approaches to support and improve the life chances of residents over the next three to five years so that we can really see that true impact of, of the COVID-19 um, pandemic as it emerges. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, so this is just a little bit of context um, on the, uh, the existing vulnerabilities and the impacts that's had. So along with outlining national context, um, the report also highlights uh, the data that is now beginning to emerge, which really shows that widening of the gap within vulnerable communities in Hertfordshire. So these can be broken down. So we've got health vulnerabilities um, where we uh, used uh, data that we have from uh, Youth Connection Survey of Young People, also the Public uh, public Health, Health and Wellbeing Survey, and also um, a survey of clinically extremely vulnerable people. And um, we've then also got social care vulnerabilities. Um, 
So very much looking at um, the children's services post COVID recovery report and also the report from domestic abuse um, food insecurities. Um, so public health um, are, are leading on this side. And also, as we can see, there has been an increase in free school meals for people eligible pupils. Um, so the increase was 5,367 more pupils between January 20 and May 21 that are now receiving free school meals in, in Hertfordshire. Um, we have financial vulnerabilities, um, so the unemployment rate has increased um, and there's also been, in, also been an increase in access for our crisis uh, support that's been offered via our crisis intervention service. Next slide, please, Ted. So taking that on board, we're now focusing on um, putting together the themes for the Building Life Chances programme. Um, as you can see, I won't go through them all, they are, are, are there on, on your screen. Um, and this work aligns with a number of other programmes and initiatives. So Hofstra County Council is really well placed to take that uh, leading coordinating role uh, and make best use of, of our resources and align with work that we're already doing. Um, so we, we have a mapping exercise underway to make sure that there is no duplication and we are linking in with existing programmes of work. Um, and uh, the mapping work will extend to, to also partner organisations, so our district borough colleagues, our VCS colleagues um, and NHS. And one thing that we really want to uh, focus on is um, the black and Asian minority ethnic communities that have been disproportionately disproportionately oh, I can't say that word impacted by the pandemic um, so this program recognizes that and um, seeks to align the work programs with the council's diversity and inclusion framework thank you Ted next slide um, so in terms of the program update and where we've got to uh, a building a building life chances steering group has been um, established and this will report into the children young people and families panel and the health well-being board as well um, so we have representatives as we said from a wide range of stakeholders and they've been invited to the stakeholder group so we have a steering group which is made up of uh, hcc colleagues and then a stakeholder group which brings in district boroughs health and um, uh, VCS colleagues as well and we're working on that mapping work to identify uh, to work underway sorry um, to, to begin in the mapping work to identify gaps so that we can target those resources appropriately. The BLC steering group will also monitor the progress in delivering the, the key performance indicators and outcomes from the funding that has been allocated to this programme from the joint bid from the council's COVID recovery fund. So that again, that just uh, really stressing that joint work between public health, adult care services and children's services here. Thanks. Um, so looking at the financial consideration, so the report outlines a number of funding streams that have assisted the county with its work with partners to support Hertfordshire residents and a number of these government grants that we've received. So, for example, the, the DWP grant, uh, the MHCLG grant that we received, they've all been short term and they have had very specific criteria as well. Um, so what we're we're working on now in building life chances is uh, to to work on making these more sustainable, uh, and also being able to identify future funding opportunities from national funding streams, and also to support partner organisations. So for example, voluntary community sector organisations to bid for this in order to meet any gaps identified from the mapping piece of work that that we're working on at the moment. Um, we will also be monitoring the joint bids that are submitted by Children's Services, Public Health and Adult Care Services into the Council's COVID Recovery Fund. Um, so that will be scrutinised and also the Building Life Chances, for, sorry, for, as part of the Building Life Chances programme. Next slide, thank you. Um, so what I wanted to focus on now was really uh, the success of 
um, the volunteering people assistance cell um, and the fact that actually a lot of this work that we're, we're talking about in building life chances um, has hap has been happening in uh, during VPAC and actually even uh, beyond that within the community well-being business as usual um, offer of support for financial um, issues. So the volunteering and people assistance cell is a multi-agency partnership so it includes again our VCS providers who are absolutely key to the to uh, mobilising really quickly um, and responding to the pandemic. Also, the ten district and borough councils. We still hold those regular meetings with our district colleagues and NHS as well. So, VPAC were part of the COVID nineteen response, and we particularly supported vulnerable residents and families, uh, and in particular those people that were clinically extremely vulnerable. And the VPAC, what VPAC did was it enhanced existing support, but it also was able to establish new support offers that were tailored for the COVID pandemic. Um, this approach has been particularly beneficial in enabling residents to get the support they need and in a timely manner. And again, just to really highlight the flexibility and the speed of mobilisation that our voluntary community sector colleagues um, provided. Next part, uh, slide, please, Ted. So this slide is just giving you a, a glimpse of some of the VPAC support that happened within that first peak. Um, I won't go through all of them. I'll, I'll just pick a few to, to highlight. But as you can see, we had 5,000 volunteers deployed. There was a, 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 as you may remember, there was a, a, a large outpouring of, of um, support from the community and a lot of people wanted to volunteer to support. Um, so that uh, enabled there to be 40,000 volunteer activities completed. Um, we delivered hot meals, we delivered 110,000 food parcels to individuals. Um, just to remind you, this was was in the first peak, um, 2,300 pharmacy deliveries. Um, Hearts Help, uh, well, which we always, we had before the pandemic, so Hearts Help is our information gateway. Um, it, um, is provided by a voluntary community sector provider called Power. Um, and when the pandemic hit, uh, overnight, Hearts Helps calls increased by nearly 300%. So as you can see, in a non-COVID year, the calls are usually 35,000 uh, per annum. During that pandemic year, so that March 20 to April 21, there was over 140,000 calls. So Hearts Help provided a seven day, 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. service. We widened the crisis intervention service criteria. So the crisis intervention service um, is that three tiered financial support for those people that need um, short term support. So through vouchers or um, white goods. Um, through to those people that need more detailed support, which is provided by Citizens Advice and Money Advice Unit. Um, so in terms of detailed benefits, advice um, and, and support that way. Um, we have our carers and vulnerable adults support. Um, Community Help Hertfordshire. So Community Help Hertfordshire was a partnership that was formed during uh, the pandemic. And this is uh, a partnership of all seven um, CVSs across Hertfordshire. And they formed um, to create a, a support network and they were able to offer volunteer support through shopping, um, pulse oximetry deliveries, medication deliveries, befriending, um, and now they're helping people get out and about. So kind of accompanying people on walks, accompanying people to the shops, you know, in, improving that um, sustainability. Um, Hearts Economic Recovery Team. So the Hertfordshire Economic Recovery Team is um, was enhancing our crisis intervention service. So again, we put this 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 was formed during the pandemic um, and it uh, was money advice unit, a partnership between money advice unit and the 10 citizens advice bureaus in Hertfordshire and, and they have formed a partnership to um, ensure that we have advisors that can deal with really complex detailed um, financial benefits advice um, that is needed by vulnerable communities in, in Hertfordshire. So um, I'll just um, pull out some statistics for you on 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 the heart team. So uh, 
so I've, I've uh, lost my uh, data on that but they are they're, they're really working really well in terms and they take direct referrals from our link workers our community navigators so the link workers we work with the gp surgery so we're able to get direct referrals there um, and they also work very closely with the district and and borough officers um, again making sure that we can take um complex cases and around debt management etc from there and support the housing officers and we've continued to support people as, we, as we've emerged from shielding and um, uh, we, we uh, conducted a, a survey for clinically extremely vulnerable population and a lot of people are still incredibly nervous about going out and about and we are supporting them in, in that journey um, and, and trying to, to get them on pathways of sustainability. And the COVID Information Champions, um, which was funded by Jim McManus, which was again delivered by our Community Help Hertfordshire, so our CVS colleagues, was where we had volunteers um, that have become COVID Information Champions working within their community, making sure those uh, COVID messages are um, accurate and uh, avoiding kind of misinformation on social media. So we're working with them really closely. Um, as I mentioned, Pulse Oximetry delivers deliveries, self-isolation support. We've been supporting with the COVID quarantine hotel um, and also digital inclusion work. Uh, and also we have um, BAME COVID workers working alongside our link workers and social prescribers. Next slide, please, Ted. So in terms of next steps, uh, the immediate response to, to the peaks um, and the, the short term recovery for VPAC is we are going to continue these additional services that we have uh, put in place to ensure that individuals can get the right access to support. Um, we're ensuring that um, people can rebuild and maximise our independence as we move out and into recovery. Um, we have funding secured for that 21-22 recovery phase. Um, we have received comp funding for vaccine hesitancy, so we are working with uh, minority groups to encourage them to take vaccine and we've been able to um, give out uh, 100 grand worth of grants grants sorry 100,000 pounds worth of grants to um, our really small community groups um, who are in faith groups or ethnic minority community groups we've also received public health recovery funding as well um, in terms of a strategic development, um, we're going to be working on a co-produced VCS preventative strat strategy, maximising the impact of the VCS on the strat statutory demand. That's working very much in partnership with the NHS. Um, we're going to be capturing the learning, um, really having a look at that relationship between statutory and voluntary services, again, building on those lessons from COVID. We're going to be finding and, and tackling those health inequalities and unmet needs that again have been highlighted during the pan pandemic. Um, looking at outcome based services, really looking at, uh, at the impact of, of evidence and really and, and again, we don't want to lose that community spirit that we had during the pandemic. And again, that's actually been shown during the Afghan arrivals response that a lot of people again want to volunteer, want to support, want to help and we want to you know, we're very lucky in Hertfordshire to have that community spirit. So we want to keep that um, keep that going and build on that. Is that my last slide, Ted, or is there one more? Uh, one more. Sorry, it's nearly over. Um, so in terms of recommendations and, and next steps, we're asking the cabinet panel to note and comment on the content of the report. And also just to note again that the Building Life Chances programme is a collaborative approach mitigating the impact of COVID-19 and improving life chances for residents and to provide providing cross-council and multi-agency partnership resource and engagements. And those are just the, 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 the dates of where, where we're going to the other cabinet panels and um, the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, very much. Excellent presentation. Questions? Um, Nigel first and Tony um, come to come up afterwards. It's going to fiddle with my screen here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for this uh, that excellent report, uh, Kirsty. Uh, this partly spells from um, uh, myself and my colleague Sharon Taylor, as members remember in July 
uh, proposed a motion on child poverty and child poverty audit, which obviously was referred to Children's Services Panel, which is next week. But I had a briefing with uh, the new uh, director of uh, Children's Services, Joe Fisher, and she said that she was hoping that this that we'd be satisfied, but pleased that this initial report, which is obviously done with our adult care, uh, is actually a start of that. And I accept that, that a lot of the stuff in here is very good. And it's a start on looking at um, uh, ch tackling child poverty, as Kirsty said. And uh, so, yeah, I, I was pleased that a lot of the things was, were highlighted in there, the figures, obviously the, the, uh, the, the voluntary work, uh, the VCS one with all the districts, uh, been fantastic uh, and very good. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, um, obviously, it's, it's a good start to us because, to say, it will be noted at Children's Services uh, about child poverty and what we wanted to do on that. But on the adult care side, it's good to see the initiatives and everything you're doing here, uh, Kirsty uh, and, and others here, and, and put into that clear way that we've just seen now. And I'm sure we've all worked with our districts. Um, over the pandemic, and, that, and that's all, all been good. Can I just ask Kirsty a particular question um, on the um, uh, equality impact assessment on page uh, 97, I think, but she did mention obviously the BAME and racial equality impact, and it does say to be in place by the launch on December 2021. Uh, this is to make sure that there is um, uh, better measures in place for the BAME community. I don't know if she can comment on that. Um, so uh, I have to say that we're still working on that. At, 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 they were doing some work on that at the moment. So um, I think we just need a little bit longer to 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 put that fully in place. All right. Well, all right. So it's in the future. I'll follow up on that. But no, 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 no yeah, problem. In conjunction with Sally or on the children's services. Yes. yes. Overall, I welcome this as at least a good start. On, and to carry on what's been done in the, in the originally and, and the very fact that you mentioned about tackling child poverty, which is what we mentioned in our um, uh, motion in July, uh, which is a good start and we'll follow up on that. But, but thank you anyway, initially, and, and thanks for this report. Thank you, Stella. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Tony. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Just going to make a brief comment, really. This seems really positive if we support it. I think it's, you know, really doing a lot with, with different partners and also use it, um, tying up with other initiatives we're doing. And as a borough councillor, I've seen during the COVID and, and in other roles, I've seen what's happened with COVID and how partnerships and working with other districts and boroughs has really worked and and also want to thank VPAC for what's happened and um and, and I think COVID's really brought out partnership working and community and if we move this forward in a joined up way I think that's absolutely brilliant so thank you very much Kirsty. Thank you Tony I so support support your comments that you just made. Christy sorry. Ron your hand. Yes uh, I, I certainly also welcome this report it's it's uh, well founded and all uh, resources and, and a fascinating read. Uh, just one little query before I go on to my major point and that is uh, Kirsty you reported seven CVSs but we've got 10 districts in the borough uh, in the county. Uh, are, are there are, are have we got double double districts? Ah, right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um. So we've got North Hearts and Stevenage CVS. So that's a double district. We've got Well Hats. Um. We've got Watford Three Rivers Trust. We've got Communities First that um, um, cover St Albans and Hartsmere. Community Action Decorum. That one's just decorum. I've missed one, haven't I? Uh, Volunteer Centre Broxbourne and East Hearts. And we also included within that. CDAH, which is Community Development um, Agency Action, Hertfordshire, so, and that is and that covers the rural communities in Hertfordshire. So we can actually say that we've got a total county working together on this, which is very good yes. because mm -hmm. it links into what I want to now, which I'm going to ask possibly for a third recommendation, Stella, at the end of this. Uh, I note uh, that uh, the first bullet point on page 41 refers to the difficulties in food poverty. Uh, adults with lower incomes tend to have worse outcomes, including poor in health. There is also a the first bullet point on page 50. Low household income is recognised as a key driver for few food insecurity. 
and I, I believe this is, is really uh, uh, sort of very much condemnation of the uh, proposed withdrawal of the 20 20 pounds universal credit supplement on the 27th of September. Mm, I should um, have mentioned that. And I would suggest that what my comments are also supported by paragraph 6.24 on page 60, where it says targeting resources su and support where most needed for most impact. And then also, I think there is paragraph 9.6 on page 65 and following pages, uh, which also refers to these issues. And so I would ask to, the panel to uh, consider a further recommendation, which is as the government action on 27th of September will be counterproductive to the efforts of the county, I strongly, uh, uh, we strongly urge government to reverse its decisions. And that we actually write to the minister on that effect. Uh, it may it may be just a, a flag flying, but at the end of the day, really? the county is united in working towards improving the lot of our residents. And yet we have a government action which is going to take away vital money for those most in need in a, in a couple of weeks' time. I think it's just ludicrous. And so I would ask that the cabinet support my request. That's it, thanks. <laughs> Do you want me to just just quick quick comment on that? I mean, it's not for me to determine whether you um, uh, write to the government or um, or or not. Uh, that's a one for you as uh, the, the councillors. Just for the avoidance of doubt for anyone. Obviously, the decision around universal credit is not one that we make as a local authority. That's a national decision around uh, a, a welfare. Um, the, the ethos of this work is to absolutely support people who will be experiencing challenges for a variety of reasons and we'll, we'll continue um, to do that, uh, whatever the, the position around uh, welfare and benefits are um, nationally. So um, I'll, I will say no more uh, than, than that. Um, uh, because uh, you know, clearly, I'm, I, my, my focus and other directors' focuses on this is, is is on those things within our within our gift and those resources we've been able to prioritise within Archer. Stella, it's Richard Thake. Can I come in? On you this? can. You can. I'm I, I, I I'm I'm grateful for Chris for pointing out the realities here. Now, I mean, okay, fine. Uh, Ron has a job to do as a member of the opposition in terms of holding this authority to account in terms of it, its actions and its activities. But this is a purely political uh, a, a, a additional motion that he's trying to put to us. Uh, and, and it's not one that I think is the function of this panel in, in the terms that Chris has outlined. We, we are here to deliver what is available. And I will not support that th additional point. Thank you, Richard. Can I say, Stella? I, I Ron, Ron I need to get some control here. I've got a lot of hands up. If you are not asking a question, can you take your hands down, please? Thank you very much. So, Nigel, to ask a qu Nigel, you want to ask a question? No. No, I'm okay. Sorry. Sorry. Can you yeah. please take if you're if you've asked a okay. question or if you're changed your mind, please remember to take your yeah. hands down for management of the meeting. Leslie, I'd just like to second exactly what Richard said. I agree with him totally. I've absolutely noted, and, and, and Tony. Uh, I'd just like to third what the other two have said, and I think this is a really positive report. And as I said before, and it's a shame if it's um, diluted by a political um, situation. So I'm not very happy to support that that amendment either. Thank you. Thank you. I, let, let's not take away from the work that's been done here and how positive this is, and the year that's been, and what we've got going forward. So let's let's celebrate the the good work. And yes, of course, there's more to be done, Ron. Recognise what you're saying, but I think we'll do it in a, in a, in a, in a different way. 
Thank you. If I may, Stella, come back. Of course back. you I, may, Ron. I, I totally agree with Richard and, and Leslie and Tony in the fact that my marks are political, but I feel the, the vo the, the, someone should speak up for the voiceless in the county and the fact that uh, on the 27th of September, they are going to be have money taken away, which is desperately needed. And, and so I am happy to use any forum I can to to push this and um, have no regrets. I also agree with you that this is a very important document. We are doing a fantastic job in the county and we should keep going. It's just a shame that the government doesn't see see that and is, is working against us. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for your comments. Respected. I agree. I agree. OK, I'm going to take, going to move um, forward with this. The, I'm going to ask you um, that the cap that to recommend that the cabinet panel is asked to note and comment upon the content of this report and note that the building life chances program is collaborative approach as set out in section seven of this report to mitigating the impact of COVID-19 and improving life chances for residents. That's what it's all about, folks. And to providing cross-council and multi-agency partnership resource and engagement. Can we note this panel? Chairman, Richard has his hand up. Sorry, I apologise. Richard. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether we ought to, as part of the recommendations, acknowledge the change in title of the paper, because clearly you mentioned it at the outset, and I absolutely understand what's gone wrong here. It's just a, a pure typographical error, but I think if we if we actually mention it, 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 the, the change to the program, then it will allow people who are not perhaps party to this meeting to understand what we're doing. Com I, I, I completely understand. Is any issues regarding that? To note the change in, in, in it. OK, I've got a lot of background noise here. So I'm going to ask us to note this. Thank you. Has Helen come through on this? I have, uh, Chair. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your uh, apologies. Yes, I have indeed. I'm, things are much better now. Thank you. Gender item no noted and, uh, and agreed. Our next, we've got no other part business, part one business that I've been um, notified of. Is there any other items anyone wish, wishes to to bring to the panel. That okay, fantastic. So sorry, no other sorry, part one may. business. No, sorry. I may. It sits for the next meeting. Uh, given the announcements in Westminster, it's early days. Nobody's seen the print. Uh, would it be possible, perhaps, at the next meeting, we could have a report back by the director on the implications of the government proposals, please? Chris. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, thanks, Ron. And one day I'm going to ask you to do a report as well, just to get my revenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, what, 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 what we'll do, Ron, is obviously we're still digesting it all, and, and there's there's still quite a lot of unknowns in it, which will come out. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is, yes, we'll do a, um, a do a, a formal report, just laying what the, what those um, recommendations are as they relate to adult social care and also specifically implications on us as a local authority and make that specific as we can. Um, in addition, because actually some of it relates to charging reform, um, this is actually, you know, a complicated area now and there's changes in the future. So I also think it might be um, sensible if we put together a, a member briefing session for people to just have a chance to ask questions, us to explain the current system uh, and explain the changes. We're more than happy to put that on. We'll, we'll open it out to all members and we'll probably do that. Um, I don't want to do it straight away because there's more detail coming out and we'll just change it. We'll, we'll give it uh, we'll give it a few weeks and, and, and may do it back into this month, early October. 
And, uh, yeah, thank you for that, Chair, if I may. Yeah, uh, I totally, uh, totally see the point of waiting because obviously the bills, uh, they've got to go through Parliament first before it becomes an act anyway. But also, can I offer my assistance in the report if I was to receive the same, you know, your salary in an ounce? <laughs> uh, yeah, touche. <laughs> Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Ron, for those comments. <laughs> I think we're in a situation, I think after this Thursday, it's a developing situation. It's not going to be going away. So there will be lots and lots of opportunities to um, to get involved in this one and comment. Um, and it's not going to be short term. As we can see, it's over the next, it's over a period of time, over the next three years. And there will be lots lots and lots of um, work done on this and um, we'll be meeting members to, um, to 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 introduce and to update all of the time any comments any any comments all right that right i am going to thank you for your time this morning really really good um, meeting thank you for your energy your contributions and your, 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 just your heart and your soul that you put into this. Really, really appreciate it. Um, Thank you, got a, no bumpy times ahead, but we'll do it. We will do it. Hertfordshire will do it. And I feel confident for our residents that we will do it. So yeah. thank you again for your time this morning. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take bye. care. Our next meeting, um, in case you haven't got it in your diary, is the 13th of October at 10 a.m. And I look forward to, to seeing panel again here and meeting with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Totally agree with your comments, Stella. Bye. 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 Bye.